Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But we'll catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast Network, home of such shows as State Change with Arthur Falls on Ramping with D, Announcements with Dr. Petty, Block Channel with Stephen Mackey, Not Another Bitcoin Podcast with Kenneth Bozak. And of course, you're tuned into the Bitcoin Podcast, episode 135. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, Dimitrik. Host number three, Corey. Yep. Yeah. What's up, guys? What up? Yeah, we're here. another week down. What do we want to talk about today? What do we? What, you want to? You want to hit him with the ad up front? Punch him. Give him the one-two punch with an ad. Sure. Episode one hundred thirty-five is brought to you by Athena Bitcoin. I don't know if you guys have been following, but Athena Bitcoin like made a lot of social media press because they're taking Litecoin, and Charlie Lee like retweeted them, and a fan uploaded a video and everything. So it's a big, big week for them. Uh, they're the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs. You can now get Bitcoin and Litecoin in Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, a bunch of other cities. Download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play for specific locations and more information. Visit that website, AthenaBitcoin.com, because they're always adding new locations. And this episode is also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, BitQuick.co, to secure a quick and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get BTC well, I don't know if you can get Litecoin, too, for cash in as little as three hours. Maybe it takes four hours or five, but it's quick. They've been serving, <laughs> in, uh, they've been serving crypto enthusiasts since 2013. So where there's a bank, there's BitQuick. And I don't know if you can see it, but I'm wearing my Athena Bitcoin hat. So I did see it. It's the, a Halloween The listeners can time. definitely not see that. Yeah, it I is Halloween it. orange with camo. Nice, swag. man. Swag, you swag, can go swag. hunting with it. You didn't I sing the jingle, though. It's bit oh. quick. Get your bits quick. See? It's that catchy. It's the most trusted name in ATMs. Yeah. yeah. All right, Corey. We want to... What's on All your right, mind? So there is something that... So we had... This conversations this week in the Slack have been fantastic, man. I'll Fire. tell you what. Uh, but there is one that got me thinking quite a bit. But talking about price discovery and trying to find a good foundation for how to think about prices in the cryptocurrency space and the relative volatility associated with prices in the cryptocurrency space. And it kind of, but it, it, at the end of the, our conversation, it fleshed out with me saying, and I, I, want, I want to try and explain this to you guys. And then if it doesn't make sense, I want you to ask me questions so that I can flesh it out even more. Right. Okay. So, all right. So how do you come up with a price in the Bitcoin space? It starts with like, if you think about what's the, what's the least amount of price you can come up with. And the majority of the time when you come up with um, how you theoretically look for a price, it will just take Bitcoin, for example, you look at what it's, what is its utility? What are people, what do people think that the network is used for and what are they actually using it for? So like, that's like, you know, remittance payments, storage value doesn't quite work for this particular thing we're talking about as a medium of exchange. Like, what is it replacing? Is it replacing gold? Is it replacing a payment processor? Is it replacing something else? And so when you make those types of arguments that ends up being like a utility price of what the network is used for. So when people are using the network, they're just sending back Bitcoin back and forth. That's the utility. 
And so that gives you kind of a floor for what the price should be. So if like in a, in a world where people only use the network for what it could be used for, you would have the basically the minimum price because that's the minimum amount of demand you need to use the network. I think I think you're using a lot of words to ask what's the intrinsic value. Because... Okay, we're just saying that, like the intrinsic value, like the the, un, the the baseline value for a network is okay associated with the demand of its utility. Let's which do means, this then. Which means that whatever people are using the network for, yeah, that's the bottom price you can think of, and yeah. what the actual price is is the utility plus speculation. And that's a big difference, right? So yeah. you have the bottom line price, which is like basically the people who are using the network for what they think the network is supposed to be used for. And then everyone who thinks that the current price or like is going to go higher. So they, they keep buying into it, thinking that in the future, the price will be higher than what it is now. They buy it and hold it, which is basically speculation. And so that creates this like difference in price from the utility price to the current price. And inside that area, those two differences between the actual price and the utility price is where volatility lives. And the bigger that difference is, the faster things can crash, the more volatility you have. And they the larger your quote-unquote bubble gets if it gets too far. Okay. I don't think anything you said is off base. So what, is that, logically presented. so what does that mean? Do you, do you agree with that? Jello, do you agree with that? Does that make sense? So what you're saying, or what I'm understanding, is if there were, was no new supply of Bitcoin, the effective price would be set exclusively by the lowest amount a current holder is willing to sell for. So if all the holders understand the potential of Bitcoin and they refuse to ever sell for less than 5,000 per coin, does that mean the price can be at least 5,000 regardless of new demand volume? Not necessarily. I'm saying that like there's the reason people get into this space is, is varying. And if you want to try and find the lowest possible price of what the, the network should be, it's going to be, what the demand is that's associated with the people who are actually using the currency. Yeah. But so there's, so there's some certain amount of subset of people in the network that are, they use, they buy Bitcoin because they're trying to use it. It makes their lives better. And then there's another set of people I would argue is a much larger set of people that are buying Bitcoin because they think the price is going to go up. I'm saying that that first set, the people who are actually using the currency sets the yeah, bottom but, line price of what th it could be so if you imagine those go ahead are for the same reason just is, time is the variable i'm buying it, a lot of my bitcoin right now because i think it's going to make my life better in the future yeah that necessarily i mean it's it's people who are using the currency for a medium of exchange are don't care about the yeah. price they don't care about the price it does something that they want it to do yeah it's making their life better it allows them and to do the something why like anybody like puts a price reasons. on anything. Anybody puts a price on anything because it makes their life better. All right, it's so like let's 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 take this this model and port it over to Ethereum. The okay. point, like the idea of Ethereum, the underlying token of Ethereum is to pay for computation in this decentralized machine. It's essentially pay for smart contract execution on the Ethereum Dynet. blockchain. Yeah. Okay, that's the utility. There's also some other, you know, utilities. You can use it as a medium of exchange. You can use it as a storage of value, but that's not the point of the underlying asset. The main point of it, utility that it's supposed to provide, is smart contract execution. So that sets some baseline of a price that the token should be at based on the demand that of the people who are using it for that. There's not a lot of people in the Ethereum space that are using Ether for smart contract execution. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there is the majority of people who are buying Ether are buying it for speculative purposes. They think that 
later on down the line, people will have to use Ether to do smart contract execution. And that, and that growth in demand means a growth in price. Yes. But if people aren't using it now, you have this baseline. Think about like a... Like a trying to, it's hard to explain over the internet or over, to, over audio. Like the, different, the difference in price... We got between, video. Use a whiteboard. Uh, people yeah, aren't watching the video. Oh. The difference in price between utility, them. like utility price discovery, and the speculative price discovery on top of that, where volatility lives, because the use case doesn't go away. But the emotion Here's, around price price discovery around speculation is incredibly variable. So like people like that's that's relegated to the swings of emotion, things that happen, things that yeah. don't. And so as that space increases based on people speculating and getting into this market, not for the utility, but because they think they're going to make money, then you increase the possible volatility and crash if something bad happens. Okay. So what it sounds like you're proposing is some sort of bubble factor. Something like, like that. Like if we could somehow hone in on the target of price discovery. Right, so the, if we got three levels of price discovery, first we sent out the Nina, then we sent out the Pinta, then the Santa Maria. All right, the Nina is just the utility. We'll call it whatever the base utility is, the amount of price that needs to be that demand. The, Think that, about demand. What, yeah, supply so and to demand. To meet the demand, let's get an equilibrium there, and then you take a second equilibrium, which is, I don't know speculation and then the distance between those two points is it just like an average and you take that and that's your no it's more subtle than that factor. unfortunately because think about this concept um all of these icos that are happening on ethereum they are essentially locking away large portions of ethereum the the available supply of ethereum mm -hmm, and when mm -hmm. you and so to, to these projects that are making a ton of money, they're making a ton of money based on people giving them all of their Ethereum. And when you keep along this trend, you continuously lock away for probably a good amount of time, maybe a few years, maybe not, depending on what those companies do. You continually lock away large portions of Ether that are taken out of the supply, the circulation of Ether, which means that as the demand grows, the supply keeps diminishing. So what does that mean for price? It means that the price goes up because there's the less go bamboozle. There's less ether available to buy, although people are jumping into the space because they think the price is going to go up, which it is doing. So you have this kind of spiral, this loop effect of prophecy of people buying something and putting it into projects that are taking away the supply, which further diminishes supply and increases price. Eventually, okay. So like this, what this is doing is it's raising that gap between the underlying utility and the speculative price on top of it. Which means that eventually, if something goes wrong, you're going to see a very large crash or if there's a potential for a very large price crash. Yeah, there's going to be one. It's not, not like it's potential. And it's, like it's this is basically us, us figuring out like, like starting from scratch of like what, what causes something like that. And the trends we're seeing that could potentially cause that to happen. The and whole I want thing people that to those are, start thinking about that. The whole thing that those are wrenched, though, in it, Corey, is that one, I hate when people ask the question. I don't hate it. I'm not that emotional. I am that emotional. But I hate it when people say, what's the intrinsic value? Because that's like asking somebody to pull out a crystal ball. In fact, I feel like the only reason people ask that question. Is because they have a lot of money to waste and they're just trying to make a quick bet. Because you can never know the intrinsic value of something until after you've it's been discovered. Well, you can you I guess you could speculate based on what the you, point yeah, of the token you, is. You, right? you speculate. Let's let's just take it on back. Take it on back to Gold Town. First guy who discovers gold. Did did he really know that it was gonna be laced on the windshields of stealth fighters because it blocks radar waves? Hell, fucking no, he didn't. 
There's no possible way we could have figured that out until we are where we are right now. Did he know that if you cover connectors with gold, that it's going to make the noise of the signal very minimal? Fuck no. Excuse my language to the kids that are listening. You never know the intrinsic value of something until it's released into humanity and people find that. You know, so, you can you can understand what it's what's point, like the point of the you understand is. its potential. Intrinsic value until somebody discovers something and says, okay, now this is that much more valuable. I'm just saying, like I think the only way to get to what you're trying to get to is to see what the price equilibrium is for the absolute bare minimum demand. Well, that's the thing. Finding the bare minimum demand is difficult, but I'm I'm saying that we're not going to be able to see that because of all of the holders, the people who are buying and holding based on speculation. Chella, do you have some? Yeah, we can. So, Why can't so, we? Well, is the market so you're saying the market cap for Ethereum is going to be pushed up as more value gets locked into smart contracts? Yeah. Well, Bitcoin can't do that. So not right now. Yeah. Do you think Ethereum is going to have a higher market cap than, than Bitcoin at some point? Yes. If the if the trend keeps happening and nothing goes wrong this year, yes, that's, that's pretty huge. Um, it also um, it also massively depends on whether or not um, August first goes through and and the Bitcoin network is capable of moving forward with the protocol upgrades. If they're capable of moving forward with protocol upgrades and nothing goes wrong there, you're going to see a lot of money. Who was sitting on the sidelines flow into there? Ooh, There's a lot of things that could happen, so we're kind of waiting for things to happen based on on yeah. what the what I think the price is going to do. So it's really hard to say because there's a lot of things that could happen that could potentially change the price drastically. If continue if 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 Bitcoin doesn't change and Ethereum continues on the trend that it's on, Ethereum will overtake Bitcoin. If Bitcoin changes and is able to upgrade its protocol, Bitcoin Bitcoin's price will rise because confident rises along with it. If Bitcoin forks, you're going to see a lot of confidence fall with Bitcoin. And so you'll see it split into two different networks and the evaluations of those two different networks will split off respectively. If something really goes wrong with Bitcoin, then you're going to see a lot of people get pumped right into Litecoin because that's basically what Litecoin's there for. It's a safety net for all of the stuff that's on Bitcoin. So this is just supply and demand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's always been supply and demand. But, but the you, thing you, about intrinsic value that I just want to get sure that I get across my opinion that probably means nothing in the grand scheme of things is, is that the intrinsic value of something is always a lagging discovery. Like, Not in the financial uh, like realm because – to find the intrinsic I mean, value in, in this, all you have to do is just look at the at the value of of it is without reference to the market value. I think Dee's talking about stuff like the the I'm potential the potential like, intrinsic value of this technology. We don't know what cryptocurrencies can do yet because we're just now playing along with them, right? So like we can't base the price or like what we think the price should be on the things that cryptocurrency will do in five years because we simply don't know those types of things. Like, for instance, if we would be able to look forward in five years and say, oh, that's what cryptocurrency is for, or like that's how it's supposed to be used, or that's how people are going to use it, then we're going to be like, then we would have a much better idea of what what the price should be relative to what it is now. But since there's no way we can do that, it's really difficult to find what the price should be based on what it's going to end up doing in five years from now. There's still things like that. Like, for instance, I don't know if you guys remember the commercial. Uh, it was like seven years back when the guy was like, hey, I found this thing on the Internet. 120 characters. That's all you can type. And the guy was like, that's dumb. And then later in the commercial, they're on a boat and they're drinking a drink. And he's like, 120 characters. Crazy, huh? Because nobody really knows. Nobody knew Twitter was going to be a thing. But now I'm upset when I see something I like. And they were too lazy to make a Twitter handle. So it's like, damn, like how am I supposed to tap into their psyche? <laughs> they didn't they didn't put a Twitter handle on there. I'm pissed off. That's that's what you use Twitter for. That's the utility of Twitter. If I want to get into the psyche of something I like, 
I go follow him on Twitter. But like nobody knows. Facebook, no one knew the intrinsic values of Facebook until now they know. If I want to do some advertising, I'm going to Facebook. I've got billions of people on there. They're data mining them every single day. I'm going to advertise on Facebook. That's a given. So, Chubba don't like that. He gave you, he gave you a I'm growl. Gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the Marge did groan just, on that. Did you just Marge <laughs> Simpson me right now? Yeah. But I mean, I'll, let you, I'll let you continue. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. No, go that. for it. I'm gonna let you finish. If I'm, if I'm, I'm grandstanding, gonna you I'm gonna let you finish. You can finish that. But thought. Google Ads has the best data mining of all time. No, I'm kidding. Um. I'm just saying, like, nobody knows the intrinsic value of a thing until that's been discovered. I think people that speculate, people that kind of understand, they see it as potential earnings maybe. But I've known since our second conversation, Corey, I was like, oh, digital uniqueness? Yeah, that's obvious. It's obviously a thing. It's obviously going to be a big deal. Like, how, can we, how can we never talk about uh, Vatalik as a person, Vitalik? as integrity? Yeah. Dull? Why don't we talk about like doesn't doesn't like humans isn't that a factor in all this? I don't it know anything about the guy. Certainly is. I, mean, I could I could talk about how I feel he's handled things based on what's happened <laughs> since he started. Why don't we talk about that after the after the interview? Why don't we why don't we transit an interview and then talk about that afterwards? Okay. All right. Drop the mic on it. We interview Margot with an X. I would say more, but she probably wouldn't want me to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, so we, we 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 got into it, like we wanted to get Margo on the show because it's interesting that she's a, like she's a comedian for Bitcoin, like right? She she does like basically stand up, focused towards Bitcoin concepts, and that was kind of the main motivator behind us getting getting her on the show. And we started introducing her on the show, and she's like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait! I do so much more than that." And we're like, well, why don't we start over? And why don't you tell us what you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I'm a boss. And pretty much how she introduced herself. And so we're like, all right, well, that's, that's a way better introduction than we could have given you. Um, we'll, move, we'll, we'll roll with that. All shots like a bouse. You guys are like, what? Why didn't she advertise that? But oh, she, she invited us on her boat. So stay tuned for that. Wait, what? You guys know I love boats. <laughs> like your boat, though. As in, as in you two, or just like, do I get to come? Yeah, I you weren't there. You don't get boat. to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, Fuck that. Sorry. I'm getting on that boat. <laughs> Dang, I curse too much. Uh, sorry, kids. That word is a word of endearment. Okay, so uh, what are we doing now? Interview? We're, I'm waiting for you to Interview. say, here it is. Okay. I mean, you guys don't like saying it? I'll say I got the pizzazz. You've been doing Here. it for a while. I think it's more than that, Corey. I think it's I put a little character into it, not just because I do it the most. Gucci. Here it is. So this week on the show we have uh Margo, who is a Bitcoin comedian, but so much more. Um and she'll probably do a way better job at kind of introing herself than me. So I'm going to I'm gonna flip it on over to Margo. She can tell you a little bit about how she got in the space and kind of what she does. Thanks, guys, for having me on. I really appreciate it. So I've been an entrepreneur in the blockchain space since 2012. I relaunched the first American Bitcoin exchange called Trade Hill. Uh, which early people probably aware of. And then I was a co-founder of Alpha Point, which then pivoted to be an exchange licensing software company. And that's still around. And then I was also co-founder of Monetigo, which was also an exchange originally and in 40 countries. And now it pivoted and is helping to move money around and has a pilot with an Indian bank. And then currently... I am VP at Transform Group, which was started by Michael Turpin. I'm sure a lot of people know who Michael Turpin is. And we are a PR firm that represents predominantly blockchain companies and token sales. So we've represented over 100 blockchain companies in over 30 
token sales, including Ethereum, Augur, MadeSafe, Gollum, Gnosis, Quantum, Eternity, Match Pool. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And we have a ton of clients right now uh, and a ton of people who want to be clients. So I'm in a very unique position of getting to see kind of the overall landscape of what is going on in this technology mostly because we work with a lot of these companies or I speak at conferences literally all over the world. So constantly meeting people. Uh, and I guess I am an evangelistic communicator. And then on top of all of that, I'm also a stand-up comedian and I combine blockchain and comedy every once in a while, like I did at the Coindesk Consensus Conference. That was just uh, last month. Yeah, I was there for yeah, that. Yeah, there. I was uh, I was in the audience and, and, and kind of really enjoyed your the set that you put on. Oh, for, you were there. Yeah, I was, and I was I was very happy to hear a decent a decent comedian talk about like try to incorporate blockchain into their set. That, that's <laughs> not something that I've ever seen someone do successfully, and I understand the difficulty of. I don't understand it, but I I am aware of the difficulty of building a good set in, in stand-up comedy and how like how much work goes into it so like that's that was like my immediate i guess uh appeal to the i guess or appreciation of the work you put into this space and it, it's interesting to see the other crazy amount of of kind of pies that you have your finger in in this space i mean you you do have a very unique view of what's currently going on and where things might go well, thanks. Uh, that's super cool you were there. Uh, apparently, the Wall Street Journal was too because they wrote a feature on it. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. <laughs> well, at, and while they were there at the same time, I'm bringing clients over. I'm like, here's the Wall Street Journal. Here's the Wall Street Journal. And he kept saying uh, to them that, oh, I'm, I'm here for Margo. And I'm like, shut up. You know, <laughs> I want you to talk to my clients. Like, you, don't have to, you don't have to let them know that's why you're here. But I actually think they are going to write about some of them. So it was two birds with one stone, my favorite. And, and I think that's what happened, too, is like the Wall Street Journal uh, story went out. And then so I'm Googling you. And I think all of these old bios and stories about you, like the, the spiders were crawling and bumped it all up to the top page. So now um, all of your old work is now on the front page. So, yeah, my Wikipedia page that doesn't come up yet because I guess it's too new. But uh, <laughs> I think it's that's more updated, and I really need to get more on top of updating that thing. But as you probably can tell, I'm super busy <laughs> doing can, all these random things. That... I can imagine that. So coming from, I guess, having such a unique perspective of the space, like it's it's clear you're kind of riding along this trend of the ICO space. How, what is your feeling towards it? And and do you feel like this type of almost hype of how businesses can fund themselves is going to become the main source of how th people do things? Or do you think you know, traditional VC firms still have a, a great place in, in all of this? That's a very interesting question because I actually moderated a panel with traditional VCs who do invest in the cryptocurrency space. One is you know, Brock Pierce, mm -hmm. two others, uh, and there the two other ones were not American. And I've actually raised money from VCs in the blockchain space, and it is it's not easy. I mean, raising money through VCs is not easy. It's very difficult, as you can probably imagine, as a blockchain company, and it hasn't gotten any easier. Uh, in fact, I think it might actually be a lot harder. And when I asked these people on the panel, is this going to kill traditional venture capital? And they didn't think it was, but they also said that they don't invest in non-American companies. So a lot of these blockchain companies are not American because there is not real clear regulatory uh, rules right now and a lot of them do block american citizens from investing so how are these companies that are trying to disrupt all these different industries supposed to raise money so that they can build these things so i think raising money in this way is very important and very needed uh, i definitely think we're in a bubble right now um and i gave a talk in a couple of places in New Zealand, you can find that video of how to do a successful token sale. And I did another one in Israel, which is, it's a little shorter. And 
there's a lot that goes into raising money this way. It's not like a get rich quick thing. You definitely need lawyers. You need to have a, a solid idea and something that people not only want to invest in, but that they're going to want to build on top of whether that's a new blockchain or a DAP, you want users, you want developers. There's so much that goes into it. And actually, I think it's a little harder to raise money in this way in some aspects because there's so much transparency that's involved. And you have so many people who are kind of on you to be accountable to them because they gave you money. So you have to have a whole plan of, you know, wh who's holding the keys to the wallet? It shouldn't just be one person. What's your policy on that? You have to constantly update the community on every step of what you're doing. And people are constantly also trying to say that you're a scam. So it's mm. really, really not that easy. And I really think right now it's one of the easy, <laughs> it's probably easier than raising VC money in this space. Yeah, I think a lot of what you just mentioned was the ideal way of going about these things. Do you feel like the people who are, <laughs> are going through them are actually doing these things or like they, they understand all of the difficulties associated with the, with the token sale? Well, I mean, we everyone we work with does because we are not working with them if they don't have it together. <laughs> and I, I, we definitely do turn some people away. Uh, we have people now coming to us so early where they have an idea. And that's why I'm so glad I have this video because I can just send it to them uh, because they're everyone's now trying to get in this space and it's completely understandable. It's a way to raise money and it seems very easy, uh, but there, there is a lot that goes into it. And I'm sure there's a ton of token sales that are failing. We just don't hear about them because people also think it's very easy to get press. I can't tell you how many people say, Oh, I know this reporter at Coindesk or I know this reporter here. Well, guess what? Reporters don't want to write about token sales because they don't want to inflate the price of your token. So there's a lot more that goes into trying to get press than I know a reporter. Well, in your opinion, what percentage of these Bitcoin startups are created with the single goal in mind of being acquired at some point? Uh, no one ever talks about getting acquired. Uh, I don't really... I think that's more of if you're raising money with the VC because that's what they want to know. That's their exit. But when you have all these tokens and we aren't representing any securities and the only company that's done that correctly has been Brock Pierce's VC fund, which sold tokens. And uh, a lot of these companies are not securities because the token is not representing equity and you're not getting residual profits uh, or derivatives and things like that. But if the company is doing well, then the price is probably going to go up. I mean, if you have more people on Ethereum and more dApps, and that means more Ether is used for gas, then that obviously is going to make the price of Ether start going up. Yeah, I'm but I don't, but. I don't hear anyone talking about getting acquired. I mean, I don't know if that's, I, I would think, I would hope not because the thing about blockchain that I really like is that it's people trying to do something on a larger scale that is peer to peer and has less likelihood of corruption and more transparency and really trying to change the world in in a large way or an industry. So it you have that kind of ethos behind it opposed to let's just try to make money as fast as we can or let's just try to get acquired as fast as we can. I think the mentality in this space is a little different or at least that's my impression. Maybe that's what people are thinking and I just they just aren't telling me that. Yeah, I've heard a few people just they just think that more funding is going to help grow the ecosystem over time and that's like the only way to do it is having like an aggressive VC. But I guess that's that's not your point of view. No, I mean, we can look at Coinbase, right? They took a lot of VC money and <laughs> I wouldn't say they're the best exchange out there. Uh, and uh, I don't even, I don't know what percentage of the company they own, but I bet you it's really not that much because they've done many different rounds of funding. Uh, and they probably have a lot 
more stringent room rules than a lot of these other companies too. And they definitely can't move as fast. Um, and they definitely haven't used any of that money on customer service, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it, it, uh, I don't know, I think. And, and if you look at how they are with the community, it's very different than these companies that are taking money from the community because Coinbase doesn't feel accountability to anybody except for their VCs. But and, and if even that's the case, because you know I've heard some stories, but this actually makes uh, companies move quickly and in the direction of what people want. It's kind of like a direct, a direct way to communicate and listen to what your users are really want you to build for better or and for worse. I mean, they definitely get a lot of complaints. Don't get me wrong about that, but they actually listen to them. It, it kind of surprises me a little bit of how much of these token sales and they get a, they get crapped on and how much they are so concerned. And in a lot of cases, more so than getting press, they're more concerned with communicating with the community and like Slack or whatever channel it is, opposed to having a statement and a press release and us talking to you know large publications and getting their message and story out that way. I haven't really quite understood that, but yeah, it's definitely it, it, it's it's difficult, and and the way that you do these types of token sales, you are more culpable to the community who's bought who's purchased them. But from my analysis, it seems as though we've kind of, ironically, well, at least within the, the the initial token sale, we've created these intermediaries buying up the vast majority of tokens, and then redistributing to people who want the token for a profit. And that's just because of the kind of the way the token sales structure is, the actual physical structure of how you purchase the tokens. And that's somewhat, I mean, I, I, I see that as ironic, but then you have this, you know, further distribution across the people who want to use the platform as a utility. I mean, this may change over time, but it's it rings true to this almost trend happening in the entire space because it's very difficult for an individual to keep up with the drastic amount of new projects that are potentially being funded or ICOs that are happening right now, as well as the due proper due diligence on these things, you see almost like people like yourself and the, the products that you offer in this kind of PR firms become the will do due diligence for you type of corporations that people just follow. Like you find some, you find some company that you trust and, you follow what they say is a good product and go there? Or do you see it more end to end user of people having to do their own due diligence and just trying to find their way through the weeds of all the things that are currently happening? Well, I mean, I think people should always be doing their due diligence, but I, I definitely do think we are kind of a, a good reference point. And I don't want to say all the press, but a lot of the press that any of them are getting is, is most likely because of us because mm -hmm. it's, it's really not easy unless you're a super big name in the industry or uh, in more kind of traditional business. It's pretty difficult, but yeah, we, we're, we've been trying to put together a, uh, a kind of newsletter. Michael Turpin started bit angels. He's one of the founders of that. So he already comes from a background of looking at projects and seeing if they're viable. So we definitely do our own due diligence on the project and whether or not we think that it's going to make money and who's involved and all the different things that you look at before you just take on yeah. a client. I mean, we definitely get bombarded with people trying to kind of get the word out on various announcements and stuff based on trying to like using our podcast as a forum or a vehicle to kind of get the word out in our small community. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of token sales. Someone told me how many, and it just kind of blew my mind there a little bit. And we're so it's crazy. We're so bombarded right now. We're hiring people like crazy. So if anyone has pure experience in the blockchain industry, which is <laughs> not many people, uh, we're the leading firm by a lot. There's not really anyone else kind of doing this. Uh, I mean, there's a couple little things that are other people doing things, but it's not anything really comparable. Uh, this was a, this was a traditional PR firm 
when it started and then early 2013, Michael Turpin started taking on other, started taking on blockchain companies to do their PR and then uh, the first token sale. Yeah, I get that all the time. Uh, people asking me what to invest in. <laughs> well, I imagine you just. You mentioned that, you know, 2012, 2013, you've been in the game so long. Uh, you know, I'm not going to ask your investment advice, but I do want to know how do you approach kind of this crypto landscape or the whole ecosystem as a whole differently in your 30s than you did in your late 20s? Uh, gee, thanks for calling out my age there. Jesus. All right. uh, <laughs> You're kind of a dick. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I look like I'm in my 20s. That's all that matters. Uh, so I guess when I first started in blockchain, I was more interested in, it sounds so cliche, but really changing the world. I lived in San Francisco. I was pretty jaded. I had an offer to run a company that sounded very boring to me. And I knew about Bitcoin. I didn't know a super much about Bitcoin. I actually almost started mining in 2011. I had free office space uh, and I, I didn't, which I would say I don't really regret because I would have felt like such a jerk with this free office space using all their electricity. But yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I, I guess I was more, I was very intrigued with the idea and kind of being part of this. I thought of it as a movement. I really did in that time and I definitely think of it still but I was less investing in in tokens and things like that and or in bitcoin because I was really the only one uh, and I did I did oh, put a tiny bit in the ethereum presale but it was more it was less about making money and more about kind of just building these companies and now I find it more enjoyable to help multiple companies and ideas. And, and actually, I've, a lot of what we do is kind of uh, give business advice and con consulting. And that's sort of wrapped into our, our PR stuff, just because Michael and I have had a lot of experience building companies. So I guess I look at it differently of um, just being more open to I don't think Ethereum is the end all be all. There are a lot of other interesting blockchains out there. I think there's room for more than one. Uh, but I'm definitely more interested in participating in uh, building my portfolio of, of cryptos. I, I mean, I'm not like super into investing, but women are into investing. So that's the other thing I want to work on is uh, is we need more women to be participating in this industry. I mean, we make up half the population and there's so many barriers to entry. I just finally got my mother and my sister uh, into the game of like giving them some Bitcoin and crypto right, and Ethereum and just opening an account and exchange and finding their wallet address. It was, it was pretty torturous for me, but I don't know. I feel like I'm compelled to do something to kind of help out with that. So I'm going to start making videos of basic things. How do you open a Bitrex account, you know, and uh, I'm doing a talk for women. I, I offered to do one and then 55 women signed up. So I'm kind of uh, going to prepare for that, I guess. But I, I guess clear. it's worth giving back. Yeah, it's very clear that I think the demand is there. But do you like? Do you have any insight as to? I mean, are there any on ramps or 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 I guess roadblocks that are there for women that aren't prevalent for for men? Is there something unique to being a woman that's difficult for getting into the space that we can't quite understand? I I think that I think that it's just not the inf information is is really written a lot of times in more technical jargon. And instead of just being kind of basic, what is this? I always say, do you know how the corresponding banking network works? Do you know how your debit card works? No. So why do you need to know how Bitcoin works? You know, you don't need to know what a hash is. You don't need to know all the technical stuff that goes into it, but trying to explain it from a conceptual point of view and and it's really hard to do this, but trying to find little things to compare it to that people 
have some sort of understanding with. I found most people don't even know what a ledger is. I didn't know what a ledger was, you know, the word ledger, what does that mean? And when you tell people, it's like when you log into your online banking account, and you see the debits and credits and your bank is keeping track of that, that's a central authority keeping track of the ledger of where everything is. And it's like, well, instead of having a central authority, all these other, all these people decide to participate in the system because there's potential for being rewarded uh, and download this ledger that's updated every 10 minutes. And that ledger is what we call a blockchain, you know, and just putting in kind of English what this is without getting into all the nitty gritty of how this technology works because in a lot of instances we don't know how the technology works i can't tell you how a tv works i'm sure there's way more men that know how a television technically works than women i'd say it's uh, this is a like a um we're now at the point um <laughs> where we're going to start to see more of the focus go towards things that aren't technical whereas before like when we all got started way back in 2013, 2014, it was, the, the space was so small and the infrastructure, the amount of infrastructure was built that only was accessible by the nerdy folk like, like me. And <laughs> it, it's, and this is even true with how you said, how you view the space now. It's like you, you, you're now more interested in providing business advice and the and kind of the, the peripheral ideas around the tech that are necessary for building things out and bringing it to the, the, the mainstream is because the, we're, we've gotten a better handle on the infrastructure and now need these other other aspects of how to build businesses and build things like that. And since we're there, we can kind of start to relay the information in better ways that's more approachable to a mass audience as opposed to just this kind of small, stereotypical white male uh, nerdy nerdy tech culture. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree. And that's pretty much what I do all day is try to pitch a story to a reporter in English of why it's interesting to people in a mass way and um, in, in mainstream, if I'm talking to a mainstream reporter. Uh, for example, carry on. Oh, I think you're covering your microphone. Shoot, can you hear me? I can now. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. So Corian, for example, which is built on Ethereum Classic, which a lot of mainstream reporter, reporters have no idea what that is, except I did see Bloomberg just wrote a long piece about it. But Corian is a, a stable token. So one Corian will always equal one dollar because they have an algorithm that creates or destroys tokens in order to keep it stable. And so it has all the positives of digital currency of being fast now low fees, uh, you own it opposed to having, you know, some sort of bank or central authority, but it doesn't have the volatility, which I think the volatility is why a lot of people hold on to, you know, let's say their Bitcoin, because who wants to pay with Bitcoin when you think it's going to go up to 10,000? I mean, I personally spent so much Bitcoin. I've traveled around the world on Bitcoin and, you know, you look back and you're just like, really? <laughs> Did I really spend Bitcoin when it was $100? That's so annoying. But it kind of takes that out and you have that stability, but all the benefits of what digital currency is supposed to bring. Are you uh, are you still pretty bullish on Ripple? Uh, no, <laughs> I stopped being <laughs> bullish on Ripple. So I, I think Ripple's, I don't, want, I don't want to talk crap about Ripple, but they, they're very weirdly corporate. And they're weirdly corporate, but but they kind of didn't have a hierarchy. I, I'm not really a big fan of when companies don't have this sort of hierarchy or at least people who are decision makers. And they just a lot of the things that they did, I wasn't really into. And I stopped working with them but their their token is not supposed to be for speculation uh, it, it's supposed to you know be a utility token and used for gas it's not one that you want to hold on to and it's gonna be worth a lot of money and this whole thing about it now having a super high market cap i mean there's different theories of why that happened um i think they're the most interesting dramatic company i, I love seeing all their stuff online of them airing their dirty laundry <laughs> 
It's like a PR nightmare. It's like what you don't do when you have a company is uh, have all this craziness online. But it's I find it very entertaining. I'm sure, it's I've never for worked building in this industry. Bits. Yeah, well, it's also so that I mean that drama was many years ago. That's the other thing with doing comedy in the space. It's there. There are not that many people around from you know 2012 that. Some of them are, you know, some of them are retired and, uh, and then, cause I can go way back and make really niche jokes about that, but not everyone's going to understand what the heck I'm talking about. So, I mean, there's a lot of new people in the space too, but the ripple drama, uh, I don't know. I don't know how far, you know, and Kraken and all that stuff. I don't know how many people are that aware of all that stuff that went on. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta stay really fresh with bits in this type of space. This space moves so fast, and in order to stay almost like um, in the meta, if you will, for your audience, I can imagine that's quite quite difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, making fun of Bitcoin Unlim- Unlimited never gets old, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you yeah, can have a problem with that one. Yeah, it's funny. I was looking back at some jokes I did uh, from a couple years ago, and I couldn't use pretty much any of them. I mean, Charlie was out of jail. Like, you know, it was just not relevant anymore. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you use your comedy to kind of address, you know, like how you were saying how like it's hard for women to be on ramped and, you know, just being a woman in the tech industry and how it can kind of be like a boys club sometimes. Do you kind of use your comedy to kind of slice through that a little bit? Well, I said this in, in my routine and this is true. The guy who got a Bitcoin on the Bloomberg terminals uh, said that I was the prettiest man he's ever met, you know? So, uh, I guess I'm not really a typical woman or he'd be like, we need to get more estrogen in here. Margo, you don't count. So it's almost like a backhanded compliment, I guess. But, uh, I, I did, I did make a lot of jokes about women in, in the space or them not being in the space, but I'm hoping to help change that. Uh, and I actually think, Every blockchain company should have women, not not because for diversity, but women really keep the guys in line. I mean, or at least that's what I've always done. They called me Margo the Muscle at Trade Hill. But women kind of have this tendency, I think, to help organize and structure and be that kind of rational sounding block. Uh, I'm sure you guys have talked to a lot of kind of crazy out there entrepreneurs in the space and so it's always good to have someone a little more uh kind of balancing that out a little bit so i always encourage get some women not just not because of this diversity thing and it looks good to have women on your on your site but because women actually are so beneficial they're they're really kind of the other you know they're the yin to the yang and if you want more users you want to kind of also cater to them too yeah, I've always, I've also I've often said, like, we've interviewed quite a few women. I always think it's interesting. Like, I, I don't want to bring women on the show because they're a woman. But yeah. when we happen to have a woman on the show, I'm always curious about their perspective as a woman because you, you think differently, you act differently. And it's, it's, it's unique. It's, it's something that I can't necessarily grasp because I'm not a woman. So it's interesting to me to try to see the world through y'all's eyes and what, how, and what that brings to the table that we don't necessarily automatically bring. Yeah, well, a lot of times you'll hear this women in tech, all this negative stuff and like all the terrible things we have to deal with and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of positives of being a woman. I can get a meeting with pretty much anyone because they're like, oh, wow, this woman wants to talk to me. Like, it's so unique and different, a a woman in this space that people are more interested to want to talk to you, you know? And Mm -hmm. so that's definitely a positive. I definitely can probably push or nudge or get people to do something more because I'm a woman probably. I don't know. Also, I have a lot of experience, but I'm (laughs) master manipulator. (laughs) Yeah. No, I, I actually want the best for these companies. The ones I work with sometimes I'm like, Jesus, I'm not getting paid enough for all this that I'm doing for you. You know, like introing you to people or telling you that this would probably be a good direction to go in and blah, 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 blah. So 
And I mean, I've, I've done that in a bunch of other companies, but now I get to do it with, you know, I have more variety of doing that, which makes it a lot less boring for me. But, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to say how my perspective is different because I've, I'm not, I've never been a man in this lifetime at least. Uh, so Touché. I don't know. I try to, I try to look at the big picture and, uh, I guess what's interesting to me is less like the little details and more of how it's going to change things in a larger, larger scale or in an industry in a larger scale, or what are the positives? How is this really helping? Um, you know, cause it's, if you're just making a car and changing the color, like what's, who cares, right? It has to be something very compelling that's changing things and how people can use it. I think that's the other thing that a lot of these companies need to focus on. What is the use case and spell it out. A lot, a lot of times people are talking from way up here, assuming everyone has all this knowledge they do, but they don't. You have to come from it as if people don't know anything and spell out why is this interesting you know i remember prediction markets i'm like who cares about prediction markets like what is i don't even really know what that means but like betting so having them explain different use cases of why this can change things and you know like what a dow is and and what are the kind of other implications besides investing in companies uh, just really spelling out what the use cases are, I think that will be more attractive to women. And I think women are pretty good at doing that. Uh, but, but a lot of times I had someone say to me, I don't know about marketing. And I mean, I don't really care. Like what, why is this important? And I was like, look, I'm sure you're going to raise a ton of money. Uh, I don't want to like say where he's from, but I'm like, I'm sure your, your sales going to go well, but do you want people to build or use your product? Right. Do you, do you want people to understand what this is or no? Because if you just want to, you know, sit in your little basement and, you know, count your ether, great. But if you want people to actually build on it and not be called a scam, then you're going to need some sort of marketing. I think that rings true with like Marcello was a marketer and we've talked with uh, Jeremy Epstein from Never Stop Marketing quite a few times on the show. And it's, it's become apparent that the majority of the, like, the people who are starting these projects don't come from it from a marketing yeah. perspective, yet that's sorely needed when you try and sell these things. And if you don't explicitly talk about the types of use cases that, you can, that will change their lives, people aren't going to come to your platform or they're not going to build on top of it. And you're not going to build that community, which is pivotal for blockchain technologies to succeed. Like you, the token is associated with the size and demand of your community and people who want to be a part of that. So if you don't expressly discuss what's the point of being a part of this community, then you're never really going to grow to what you think you can. Exactly. Awesome. I think that's a, that's a, a kind of a, a great way to wrap, wrap up this, this interview. And of course we have, I mean, before, I asked the last question, which we ask everyone. Is there some question that um, I should have asked you that I didn't? I I don't know. Maybe I don't. <laughs> I can't. I can't think of anything. I guess. Like, Wait, you could ask when I'm writing my tell-all book about blockchain people. <laughs> beautiful. What? Are, when are you doing that? And what is it called? <laughs> Uh, I don't, I was just, I was half kidding. I don't know. I, does, is that even interesting to anyone? <laughs> I like, I like reading books about like kind of like you're talking about like nitty gritty of all the people in the space you've come across or, or, or yeah, like, it's, oh yeah, I mean, let's it, do that. The one, the one <laughs> cool thing about the space is that it is, I mean, it's like for better or worse, it is pretty small. And if you were here early, everyone kind of knows everybody and you probably, everyone's probably like worked with everyone at one point or another. Um, and it, it's kind of like a, because it's we're building all these trustless communities uh in a way there is trust kind of needed if you're just sending digital currency to someone because you can't get it back mm -hmm. so reputation i would say is pretty important in this space and the level of drama is just so interesting to me you know like a lot of the ethereum founders don't talk to each other like some are friends with each other and some aren't and i don't know I, maybe that's I don't know if that's like a woman thing. Uh, I don't want to like put gossip in there, but I, 
I do think it is interesting, the little dramas everyone has and, you know, the post everything online. And uh, I don't know. I just I just think it's interesting. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else does, but I like following it. Oh, for sure. I'd love to give me the nitty gritty. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, to put you on the hot seat one more time, Jelly, you want to go ahead and ask the last question? Yeah. Um, in 10 words or less, can you describe the blockchain? Oh, wow. I really should have listened to one of your podcasts before I came out. <laughs> <laughs> on Front Street. Uh, the, the blockchain? So it's a ledger that is immutable and has no central authority all right i think that's nine oh, if i count right it properly it. all right nailed oh, it. i won yes <laughs> and i didn't say it was swift do i get extra points for that uh yes do you know what i'm referring to <laughs> no oh, okay all right then, <laughs> then that's <laughs> that okay then uh i'm not gonna promote their scammy podcasts like the troll podcast but anyway that was some some people might might get that reference i hope they um, do and they get a kick out of it <laughs> all right margo well thanks for coming on the show i, I enjoyed talking to you and kind of seeing your perspective in the space and, and how things are going yeah awesome if you ever have any specific questions or if you need any companies to come on uh we have a ton of them and we are we, we do our due diligence of sorts so i think they're interesting doing interesting things so cool oh we have a conference oh, wait wait can you guys promote yeah, this too? At it. okay we have a conference in barcelona july 16th to 18th and it's the first and really only crypto investment conference so there's a we have an ico boot camp on the first day that uh is additional if people want to do that and there's going to be a lot of token sales current pre post and a lot of investors. So I know there's going to be some digital currency funds there, uh, some investors, old people in the space. Uh, Ethereum founders are going to be there. Uh, I'm going to be there. Sasha from Waves is going to be there speaking. Uh, a ton of other interesting people. And one of my favorite things about it is that it's pretty intimate. And it's a lot of it besides being panels and talks is really focused on kind of dinners. So we're doing a dinner in the Gaudi museum Ooh. and I think we're doing a party on a boat. So we're really into the food and party parts. And, uh, and we also have a startup competition. So if anyone wants to enter that, uh, feel free to do so. And we are choosing a few companies to participate in that. Where can they go and you guys should come. That? Yeah, you guys should come. You, you had me at boat party. <laughs> <laughs> Get me at Barcelona. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be really fun uh, and informative. The last one we did in Puerto Rico, a ton of deals happen afterwards. So it's it's a really good place to meet people. And since it's like my part of my thing, I introduce people, and make sure that the right people are definitely meeting other people. They should, and it'll be fun. So coinagenda.com. Where? Coin coinagenda.com. And uh, I would suggest emailing me uh, for if you're interested in sponsoring or uh, being in a startup competition. Uh, but if you want to go, you can buy tickets at coinagenda.com. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. All right. Well, I'll see you later on a boat. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. And welcome back from the interview with Margo. Not just a Bitcoin comedian, but also a mother-loving boss. She calls shots like a boss. If you guys are unfamiliar with that song by one Houston rapper, Slim Thugga, by his, his, his actual name was Slim Thug, but he actually had a song called Like a Boss, um, and it was amazing. Probably one of the best songs ever. Should have won a Grammy. Yeah. Um, yeah, didn't the Island Boy, what are they called? Lonely Island Boys? Yeah, they parodied that song. Mm hmm They did. The Like a Boss from Lonely Island is not the original. The Island Boys. I'm a dad. I'm out of touch. <laughs> the Island Boys. Isn't that what you kids listen to? The Island what the, Boys. What are they on the island? They're Hawaiian shirts. Back in my day, we had the Beach Boys. <laughs> then you got Island Boys. They were a rip off. <laughs> um, so 
Did you guys enjoy that interview? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Have we ever had an interview we didn't? Oh, yes, we did. And it was, uh, what's that rapper's name? Lil B. Lil B. I like that one. I, I'm i so glad I wasn't present for that interview. I would have just been like, dude, who, who was, are you? That was the worst interview on the planet. So what do you think about Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin is family. Bitcoin is love. Bitcoin is the world. You plant Bitcoin, it grows. Bitcoin. I was like, you don't. You don't know what Bitcoin is. You we used this soundbite for like a year. So at least we had that call for us. Yeah. So out of it. You know what I'm saying? Bitcoin is like a genie. If you rub it, you get wishes. It comes out. It's great. Bitcoin. Uh, anyways. Oh, I did want to. I did want to say something. I came across. Um. Uh. There's this guy named Arthur False. Schopenhauer, who's a no. German philosopher that Jeremy linked to in his blog, and he said that all groundbreaking ideas pass through three fundamental stages and i think it applies to cryptocurrency do you guys want to hear it yes you guys want to hear the steps yes nah, all right let's do that next week oh. all right we're all out of time i'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> all right. no i got better things to do <laughs> all right first stage they are ridiculed as new ideas are created they often do not fit into the existing frameworks of society and as a result they are often mocked and regarded as absurd or impossible Mm -hmm. which is very true. Second, they're violently opposed. Once an idea acquires a certain degree of popular support, it might encounter resistance from those who see them as a threat. People are accustomed to familiar concepts and are often reluctant to adopt or adapt to something new. Although many ideas will be recognized as viable, those with the potential to disrupt the status quo will be strongest contenders to find opposition, particularly by people in power. And last... Third, they are accepted, but they're accepted as being self-evident. So as more evidence is released to substantiate these particular ideas, they progressively enter the mainstream and eventually become accepted as a given. And I feel like the, these fun, these three fundamental stages are going to apply to crypto uh, pretty on point. I, I can agree with that. Think. I feel like we just listened to the seven stages of grief for disruption. I think that yeah. we just heard that old saying. Uh, first they laugh at you, then they fight you, they join you. Yep. Ridiculed, opposed, and then accepted. Accepted because we're, of, we're probably in the because of one. overwhelming yeah. evidence. I mean, I don't know. Where I we might be half it's really hard to say because you can find people who do all three of those things. The majority of people I'd say were we were to like do it in a probabilistic sense or like statistically. It's between two and three. Yeah, I, no. People I don't are think people are fighting us. People like people are fighting the idea of cryptocurrency by building I their think, own cryptocurrencies by trying to do their own product. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's a great idea. What we're going to take part of it and do it ourselves, like the intranets, right? Like the real innovation of the internet was the internet and not intranets. But intranets were pivotal in the, in the in the innovation that was the internet mm -hmm. and we're in a simple so like that's kind of like the step between two and three they're fighting you they're kind of trying to placate towards what you're doing because it's useful because there's been it's shown to be useful and shown efficiencies for certain things so they're like all right we'll try it out we're going to do it in our own way and then i feel like that's kind of where we are now and then eventually over time as things grow people join the fold because there's overwhelming evidence of how good it is and you can't fight it anymore. It's like we want we want the latest and the greatest, but then we're reluctant to adapt to something new. It's like we're creatures of habit, but all this great stuff is coming out every day. Well, you need to have some type of verifiable evidence. Like there's there's a risk assessment associated with what the potential loss is if you adopt this brand new thing. Like if if you adopt the immediate brand new all the time you're going to get burned because the immediate brand new yeah. hasn't had time to flesh out all the bugs you can't find out how to game that system so on and so forth so if you put a mm -hmm. lot of value into something like that you're going to get burned and so it takes a while for people who are trying to port over a tremendous amount of value or risk before they're comfortable doing so 
I think you actually touched on something. You flirted with something that was kind of brilliant in there. All right. And that's that eventually all these altcoins are going to meet a glass ceiling. And it's not until all of these alts and all of these things meet that glass ceiling that initiatives like chain interoperability and one single code to connect all these chains becomes a big deal. And then the whole system grows. Yeah, I mean, it's not until they reach that point. Interoperability is the key for all of this. Yeah, people are going to realize, like, they're going to say, like, this is cool. Like, Ethereum's a great network. Bitcoin's got its thing, and Litecoin has its thing. These are great networks, but I feel like they can't get any better. And then somebody's going to come along and say, "What if we connect them all?" Skadoosh. Then the sky's the limit. And I hope it says Skadoosh when you log into the app. Whatever it is, where'd you where'd you find that quote, Cello? Uh, Jeremy Epstein posted it on his Never Stop Marketing blog. I have to read that one. I've read that. Is it like a recent one? Yeah, uh, he, I know what... he posted it today. It was basically saying who's going to be laughing in six years? You or them? And he was talking about how Eric Voorhees was a thousand times on his original investment, and how the power of holding and faith is a is a. a a better idea to have than thinking, you know, this is a Ponzi scheme and then selling. One thing is for sure. I'm not a petty man, but I was a petty person in my time. And there are three humans for sure that ridiculed the hell out of me for my All the passion. girls that did my boy D wrong, he's rich <laughs> now. So, well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry to my ex-girlfriends. You, you Chill with your poor, poor boyfriends while my man, he is balling. He's dropped the ball. But I'm talking about there's three individuals very specifically. And I can't wait for them to hit me up on Facebook asking for cryptocurrency advice because I will charge them for my time. Wait, you have to out one of them. No, <laughs> no. They'll know who they are. And it was a very deep ridicule. It was a deep ridicule to the point where I was like, wow, you guys just think I'm stupid, but. Wait, is this someone who's uh, like uh, more than just a Facebook acquaintance? Is this a friend? I'm not going to give the details. All right, so this person. Here's, here's a question. It's like uh, people get ridiculed, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, for for like really believing in something and trying to like share that type of wealth. What was it that made yeah. you say, "All right, screw you. I'm going to keep going with this." Like, what, what, where they where'd your confidence come from? That was like, "All right, no, I don't. I'm not going to take this ridicule. I'm still going to believe in this type of stuff." Because that type of behavior, if people oh, are ridiculed oh, and they don't have that you, rock to hold on to, hold up, I got they're going to let I go. Got you, fam. Use the word belief. And I typically don't like that word because it's been bastardized throughout the years. Uh, it's two syllables, B, uh, leaf. But right in the middle of that, there's L-I-E and there's lie. And there is a word called be lie. So look that word up. And tell me what it means, and then tell me if you really like the word "believe" after that. But don't give me that nonsense. I didn't, I didn't believe in Bitcoin. I understand math, and I read the white paper, and I was like, "Oh, that makes total sense." That's period. It? Math is math. Men lie. Numbers like what do they say? Men yeah, lie. There's more than lie, that. It's more than don't. that, right? It's it's like, this is a this is. The whole push, the whole ideology behind what we're trying to do. I keep using that damn yeah. word. I can't find a better one. But we're building communities. We're allowing people to communicate better. I mean, yes, it's based on math. It's based on cryptography. That's the reason why we're building better relationships and better, better ways of communicating with each other. But at the end of the day, it's all just people. It's all people coming together to make this community better than what it, what it was beforehand. That's very true. But I think abstractions are the most powerful when they're pure. And a lot of the mathematics that Bitcoin is based on is very pure from the definition of pure mathematics. And I was like, oh, like, yeah, this works. I can see that working. So that's why I put more then, well, it started out as just my dollar because you were like, you're stupid for not buying this when I told you to the first time. And I was like, you're right. And then, <laughs> then it started to become <laughs> much more. And um, 
Yeah, for me, it was just the math. I mean, if if you look up, what is it, elliptic, elliptic curve? Uh, ellipt, ellipt, elliptic curve cryptography. Yeah, elliptic curve cryptography. Um, I don't quite understand all of it. I don't quite understand all of it, but I understand a lot of it because I was educated in it. And it's it's a good bet. It's all a bet. So, do you ever listen to Most Deaf Mathematics? Um, I do not. What am I missing? I don't know, just maybe we should make it the outro music. Well, we have a higher potential of being sued for our music choices now, so we should. <laughs> start. Do we? Do we though? Yeah, most F will see you though. Most F, will, most, I've I've, I've heard some stories about most F, so maybe we shouldn't. All right, well, listeners, like, pause the podcast and go listen to it and come back. Yeah, go listen to most F mathematics, and then the first person to post most F mathematics in the general Slack channel will get from me, Demetri Ferguson, ten dollars in Bitcoin. But don't be cute and say Yasin Bay. All right, it's most deaf. Yeah, if you say that Yasin Bay stuff, I will boot you from this Slack. <laughs> I will click your name, and I will click get out of this Slack. Get the fuck out of here. Man, All right, on that, this week. let's leave. Okay, so that's, that's that. It's a great show. Hope you guys liked it. You know, we get to talking. You know, hey, if you're listening and you're like a part of a company, and you think your company needs help getting the word out? You know, we like sponsors, so we hit up Nike. They were like, "What's Bitcoin?" And we were like, "Well, you don't even need to care. You're Nike." Uh, we hit up Hanes Underwear, and they were like, "That's just weird. Bitcoin has nothing to do with." Underwear. I feel like we should start going after these people that you you really want to say we're sponsored by. Like these random yeah. places, random companies. We should just start going after them so that we are sponsored by them. So the one day you do it, we're like, really though, we're sponsored by Cheerios. Yeah. There's, there's three people I'm looking at. <laughs> Cheerios, Under Armour, and um, damn, what was the last one? Uh, Q-tips. Oh. Q-tips, yeah. Yeah. If we, also- are, if we get, go ahead. We're also brought to you by the 2017 science fiction film thriller Transformers The Last Night in theaters now. Yeah. That movie's out now? No, they didn't give not. us money. We're not sponsored by them. Fuck that movie. That movie's a pile of <laughs> shit. Michael Bay Dude. suck a... <laughs> Dude, the, I watched my... I took my sister to watch the, the last Transformers movie and it was so bad. I walked out. We had to have like... Yeah, we almost walked out. And let me tell you the exact moment we started to almost walk out is that when Mike Wal- Mark Wahlberg, with his Boston accent, was supposed to be a central Texan inventor. And was, I got this truck. I think it's a Transformer. I'm from Texas. I'm from Texas with a truck. I'm an inventor. And I was like, this dude's not from Texas. This dude's from Boston. Say hi to your so, <laughs> Say hello to your mother for me, okay? Say hi to your mother. Now mother I'm gonna for me, talk to a goat. <laughs> That's cool. Go. That's cool. I produce Entourage. I know we're getting like super off the rails, but me and my wife walked out of that movie when um when the FBI rolled up on them in the field where you can see for miles and miles, but all of a sudden they were like, Oh, where'd all these black Tahoes come from and helicopters? Oh, you got us. Me and my wife promptly got up and walked out of that shit. I bid you adieu. Adieu. I bid you adieu. Um, All right. We're done. We're done. I, I can't think of any other movies I watched. I had a date pull me out of. Sorry. And then we're done. The movie where Brad Pitt's like a hitman. Killing him softly. Killing him softly. Did I tell you about that story? Where like I took a date. It was a first date. I took her to see Killing Him Softly, and I was like, it's got Brad Pitt. Can't go wrong with Brad Pitt. Like 20, 30 minutes. Shotgun blast to the physics. Point blank, 4K, (laughs) shotgun blast to the face, brains on camera. And I was like, oh, boy. So He didn't kiss him softly. You want to make out or or what? (laughs) 
Huh? You want to make out or what? Yeah. So try and get some dome. Try and keep those. <laughs> try and keep those brain bits off of your brain and help me out with some brain. Nice. Anyways, um, we need to stop getting adult rated. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at the BTC Podcast. Uh, Cello Man's the Twitter. If you tweet at us, he will tweet back at you. Um, and then Corey will piggyback and correct my tweets sometimes. Yes. yes. Hey, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Corey is like the ultimate spell check. Yeah, I'm like a spell check. I'm like the annoying spell check. That's like, hey, you sure about that? Did you mean to say spell that? Check, I spell am, check. Spell check and I logic. am the like Microsoft 95 paperclip. <laughs> Do you like, tap hey, on people's screen? Hey, ding, 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 did you mean to write ding, that? Ding, ding. I don't think you meant to write that. Let me fix it for Most. you. Most question mark? Really? Most? <laughs> Most? <laughs> Not the right there. Um. Anyways. Um. <laughs> uh. What else do we do, Corey? You know what, man? I'm gonna go ahead and say you're becoming a rock star with your ICO and analyses. Uh, I gotta write the status one. I'm on that one. Yeah, man. People are like, mm, let me get some of that Doctor Petty article. This spread week. thin. Mm. Getting spread thin. Let me get that Doctor Petty injected into my veins. So um, my wife says. Bit, but. Corey writes blogs. He posts them here. He posts them on Block Channel. He posts them on his own. Uh, when I say here, I'm talking about our medium, medium.com. Um, the website, thebitcoinpodcast.com, the ethereumpodcast.com, the ethereumpodcast.net, the ethereumpodcast.info. <laughs> um, we own all of those. Com. Yeah, blockchainpodcast.com. Okay, here's the thing. Um, this is just a life pro tip. If you buy a web domain, I know it sucks, but buy the privacy package or else you're going to get like 37 phone calls a day that are all advertisements. Buy that package. Um, what else do we We're do? We're done. That's enough. Just, just Google search Bitcoin podcasts. Yeah. That's us. Shout out to uh, Zoe Saldana. Um, I saw you in that black dress, girl. You're doing it. Apologies to Mr. Zoe Saldana. No, no apologies. Uh, the show's weakness. Well, I mean, I'm just trying to be a gentleman. The man's nope. married. No. Nope. Do I just take his girl? Yep. Mr. Steal Your Girl. Mr. Steal Your Girl. Yeah, right. Um, oh, I got I got one announcement next week. Three Pete, another three Pete guest, Moritz Beerling, is coming back on the show. But this time, nice. he's not teaching classes. He's now a blockchain reporter for New Fund out in Berlin. So we're going to talk to him about that. Man, there was so much potential there. You just dropped it. I thought you were going to say, like, this time he's not teaching classes. He's kicking asses. Ooh. Well, I just see Corey's face. And I think he, he, if I prolong this anymore, he might just drop out. <laughs> okay. So, get a block right, away. Right, so, so uh, play the outro. Play the outro.